In our final look at metabolism and enzymes in general, we're going to conclude by looking at three separate things to conclude and finish up our discussion on enzymes altogether. This final flowchart will be entitled Enzymes 3. And the first thing that we'll speak about in this flowchart um, is the idea of metabolic pathways. We've mentioned that enzymes are a part of metabolism because they're involved in energy changes and in energy transformations and making and breaking bonds, etc. But we haven't really looked at the idea of metabolism specifically in the enzymatic function uh, of these, uh, these past couple of videos. So we're going to look at metabolic pathways very quickly. Metabolic pathways are what defines our metabolism. Metabolic pathways are simply defined as organized sets of chemical reactions. One of the simplest definitions for one of some of the most complex things known to human knowledge, honestly. These are organized sets of chemical reactions. What we can state about these organized sets in the most simplest of terms, the most simplest of examples, is the idea that we start with one molecule and we're going to go on a path with this molecule. This is going to be a metabolic pathway. We're going to start with one molecule, let's say. And we have this one molecule, and it's, under, it's going to undergo some changes. It's actually going to be altered, let's say, um, via several steps. Many steps will alter the way that this molecule either looks or functions or just the overall characteristics of this molecule. So altered via several steps. Once we've altered it by several steps, um, we actually realize the importance even more so of enzymes. Okay, well, let's remember this is all about enzymes. We realize that each step, every single step in this process, in this metabolic pathway, each step, who do you think catalyzes or sparks each of these steps? It's going to obviously be by enzymes. And interestingly enough, each step in most situations um, is catalyzed by um, a different enzyme. Every time you go from one molecule to another in this overall long drawn process of a metabolic pathway, a new enzyme will complete a function to have an alteration done to a certain molecule, let's say. The end result of this is very simple, but again, all of this complexity led to this end result being that we have a new product. We started with one molecule, and we ended up with a new molecule through what? A metabolic pathway catalyzed by enzymes. This is the role of enzymes in metabolic pathways and in metabolism as a whole. And we can sort of apply the knowledge of enzymes in many different ways, saying that the enzymes, let's say, catalyze it by lowering the activation energy of converting, let's say, uh, molecule A to molecule B and then molecule B to molecule C, etc. So that is the idea of metabolic pathways. Now that we've understood its role in metabolism, we can actually look at a very interesting concept known as um, enzyme inhibition. And if you know uh, already, in, when you inhibit something, you stop it from happening. So enzyme inhibition actually occurs within us, and it's sort of a process to regulate the way enzymes work, because we actually don't want enzymes to always be constantly on. It's actually a waste of resources, and it's not very resourceful to constantly have enzymes working. So what can you do? Um, enzyme inhibition is the idea that um, certain chemicals, let's say, certain chemicals can inhibit or destroy an enzyme one being less severe than the other, of course, can inhibit or destroy an enzyme. And these chemicals can either inhibit or destroy it um, in, in a manner that's either reversible, so that it can you know, go back to normal, or actually irreversible, damage beyond going back to normal. We can look at both of these types of inhibitions, reversible and irreversible inhibitions, in a little bit more detail. Reversible inhibition, which we'll do here, is the one more commonly seen in nature. The one that is actually happening in you right now. Reversible inhibition, as the name mentions, is reversible. It can go backwards and it can be undone. There are two types of reversible inhibition. One of them is known as competitive inhibition. And the other is the opposite, which is known as non-competitive 
we'll say non-comp inhibition. I'll just say inhib. So there's competitive inhibition and non-competitive. I'll actually just say non-competitive because we know that it's inhibition. So competitive inhibition involves the idea that we have an inhibitor, something that's going to inhibit, that sort of, let's say, um, is almost equal to, that's an almost equal to, uh, squiggly equal sign, um, to the normal substrate. It looks almost exactly like the normal substrate. And because it looks almost exactly like the normal substrate, what's going to happen is that the inhibitor and the normal substrate are going to compete. What part of the enzyme are they going to compete for? What part of the enzyme is also so, so important? Of course, it's the active site. So the competitive inhibition, which involves a competitive inhibitor, competes with the substrate. So we'll write that down. Competes with sub for enzyme, and I'll just write AS, active site. We compete for the active site if we're an inhibitor. This is what it means by competitive reversible inhibition. This inhibition is competitive in nature. I'm going to have some molecule, some chemical, that's going to compete with the normal chemical and see which one can get to that active site first, because once you've gotten to that active site, something will happen. The interesting part is that once a competitive inhibitor gets to the active site, um, it actually uh, causes nothing to happen. The competitive uh, inhibitor can't, and that's in big bold letters, can't do um, the catalysis that needs to be done. It cannot spark that uh, equation. It cannot spark that formula. It cannot spark that reaction because it's not the real inhibit. It's not the real substrate. It's an inhi inhibitor. It's there to inhibit, and. The reason why this is reversible is because, um, and I'm just going to do this over here, um, it occupies its position, um, it occupies this um, temporarily, we'll say. Temporarily. That's why it's reversible. It's going to come in, it's going to compete, it's going to stay there, and when it needs to leave, when the body says, all right, we don't need to stop this enzyme anymore, we actually need this enzyme, it's going to leave, and then the real substrate will come in in order for the real catalysis to happen. Non-competitive inhibition, I like to think of it as sort of the sneakier version of competitive. It's a very sneaky version because what happens is we have an inhibitor combining, oh let me just rewrite that, we have an inhibitor combining with the enzyme, but the interesting part here is that this combination, this connection is happening at a non-active site, at non-AS. It's happening at a spot on this globular protein, because remember, this is a 3D structure. The enzyme is a 3D structure, and it has 3D space. It has a space that's known as the active site, but it has all this other space as well. And the inhibitor is going to combine at some other space of this 3D globular protein, and it's going to inhibit non-competitively. What this is going to actually do, the sort of um, reaction to this action, is that the inhibitor, once it binds to this non-active site, it actually changes the enzyme's shape. Um, and it changes the enzyme's sh entire shape so much so that the enzyme itself, and this is why it's an inhibitor, the enzyme plus substrate, the real substrate, can't happen. Because of this change. And this change happened because of this inhibitor. This inhibitor caused a, this is called a conformational change, a shape change on this protein. And this protein was changed so much so that the regular substrate can no longer bind and attach to it. This is why I call it the sneakier version of, of uh, the sneakier inhibition because it doesn't care about the active site. It doesn't go for you know the spot that you would imagine it to. It actually goes to a spot that's away from it and is able to succeed in that sense. And of course, this one also can, it only occupies that position temporarily because it's reversible. Irreversible inhibition, which we'll do over here, it's not too much to write, so you can put it on the side. Irreversible inhibition is a little bit different because this is actually the permanent inactivation. Permanent 
inactivation, or even the permanent um, destruction, let's say. So slash destruction, we'll put a slash over here, slash destruction of the enzyme. This is often seen when we look at um, people that suffer from mercury poisoning or even lead poisoning. These are two extreme inhibitors of enzymes. They are extremely good at really causing our enzymes to dysfunction so much so that they are irreversibly, irreversibly dysfunctioning because they either get destroyed or permanently inactivated by very dangerous chemicals like mercury and lead. So that's the reason for you know the danger of mercury and lead poisoning. And the last thing that we'll talk about for this lecture on metabolism is the idea that enzymes, though they work really well as you know independent structures, they actually um, sometimes utilize helpers. Enzymes do need help sometimes, and this is uh, going to occur when something uh, else besides the enzyme may bind to it. So something may bind to enzyme or even the substrate itself to help the cause of the overall, let's say, goal that the biological reaction wants to do. If there's a goal that needs to be done, the body, let's say, the human body will do everything possible to reach that goal. If that means utilizing helpers along with enzymes to promote a reaction to happen, that's what will be done. We see this specifically in two forms. We see cofactors, and you've probably heard of cofactors before, and you have definitely heard of coenzymes. Coenzymes help enzymes work. These are the ones that are going to bind to enzymes. The helpers that bind to enzymes are coenzymes, and these are usually um, organic. What I mean by this is that when you eat vitamins, you can write VIT, you are eating coenzymes. Vitamins are important to you because vitamins are exactly that. They are coenzymes that help enzymes function. And enzymes are everywhere within you. They are in every single cell in your body. That's why it's important to make sure that you get those vitamins within you because they help enzymes out. Cofactors are a little bit different. Cofactors are actually inorganic. And these are usually the trace metals that we eat, like magnesium, like zinc, like iron. These are cofactors that also help metabolic processes to occur. So overall, we've concluded our discussion on metabolism <clears throat> by looking at metabolic pathways. We now know that a metabolic pathway is simply the idea of going from one simple molecule to a totally new, sort of more complex molecule through several steps catalyzed by enzymes. We also looked at enzyme inhibition in great detail. There are two types of inhibition, reversible and irreversible. Reversible inhibition contains competitive and non-competitive inhibition within its own um, uh, realm. Um, and we also know that chemicals, certain chemicals, can inhibit or destroy enzymes. Those chemicals include like mercury and lead. Those inhibit or destroy enzymes at an irreversible degree that's permanent or uh, that's absolutely destructive in nature. And finally, we talked about helpers that bind to enzymes or substrates. This is why we need to take in inorganic metals like iron, like magnesium, like zinc, and this is why we also need vitamins. So now we have a better understanding of metabolism, and that concludes our lecture series on Lecture 7, Metabolism.